This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. Well, I woke up this morning with a burden to share a few important thoughts with you, along with a number of reminders of what we have been attempting to warn all of you about over the past five years here at Sovereign Nations. And so today's podcast is a reminder that if you want to make some news that was going against you or momentum that was coming against you vanish these days, Don't try to hide your now obvious propaganda of the past. Just come up with four other bits of data that differ greatly and start a new data fight. This is historical amnesia through information overload. When we lose not just the data, but the record of who did and said what in history beneath the noise of contrary claims, then we are in trouble. To get rid of an enemy now, you don't have to prove anything against them. Instead, you use the internet to generate conflicting accusations and contradictory data. You use confusion to elevate hatred and fear until that enemy is either banned from the net, their history rewritten, or erased from the minds of millions through conflict-induced apathy. That sentence was actually inspired by Milan Kundera. So today's podcast is coming to you with the same warnings that accompanied my first podcast in 2017, with an intense burden to hopefully redirect much of the current road of focus or path of non-reality or hyper-reality that so many of you are currently on your way to pursuing. And I say this because from day one of the founding of Sovereign Nations back in 2017, I have warned you that currently the greatest weapons that your opponents can use against us to distract us and to break our focus from what we should be really concentrating on are both ideological and propaganda based. So many years ago, we discussed the twin tools of overt propaganda known as the fertile fallacy, and reflexivity. And years ago, I explained the construct and function of the fertile fallacy. And the fertile fallacy simply defined is a fallacious notion that is wrapped with something that has the veneer of truth. In other words, something that is true, but that then is given at its core a false substance of the truth claim that allows the tacit acceptance of the truth claim, but it propels the false premise contained within the fertile fallacy. In other words, there might be a partial truth in the fertile fallacy, but at its core, there is a grand lie that is covered, cloaked with the very thin and very fragile 10% of the fertile fallacy that might be plausibly true. For instance, It just might be a fertile fallacy to say that Joe Biden received 7 million more votes than Donald Trump. Because yes, it is most likely true. There were likely 7 million more votes that went to the corrupt, confused, and bewildered script reading Joe Biden. 7 million more votes. But in truth, this may be a grand and quite effective fertile fallacy. And what I mean by this is that, yes, there may be 7 million more votes tabulated for Joe Biden over Donald Trump, but the question is whether or not there were actual legal voters, human beings, or otherwise attached to those votes. So when someone says Joe Biden officially had 7 million more votes than Donald Trump, you can say, yes. Subjectively based officials have authorized the reported number of 7 million more votes for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. But it doesn't mean that those 7 million votes 
were from legal citizens with a right to vote in U.S. elections. Legal citizens who are currently above ground. Or from actual people and not just replicated voting ballots. Because if you were just counting votes without authorization that those votes are connected to a living, breathing, authorized, legal, fully cognizant U.S. citizen who made the volitional decision to vote for Joe Biden, then you might have a problem. Because what you have just witnessed in 2020 was possibly one of the most consequential, fertile fallacies in the history of mankind. So the 2020 election might have been the great lie that has legs. A lie that has legs. In other words, a lie that might have a short shelf life. Because as soon as the undergirding core fallacy is exposed, the entire fertile fallacy will fall apart. But until it is fully exposed, the fertile fallacy will keep rolling and insist that it is truth, or at least the moral truth, because the fertile fallacy is not bound to the scientific method and the tests of falsification, let's say, because the fertile fallacy's primary concern is its own operational success, as long as it does the job that it was intended to do. And after it has done its intended job, it doesn't care if it's shown to be a lie. It doesn't matter. It just moves on and creates the next lie and distracts the people that are going, whoa, wait a second. You misled all of us down this road because they'll quickly find something else to distract you with. So the fertile fallacy serves a purpose to ensure operational success. And certainly, if you were a Democrat, a member of the World Economic Forum, or a Republican in name only, like Mitt Romney, Ben Sass, Lindsey Graham, Adam Kinzinger, or Mike Pence, or someone of that ilk, you would say that in the 2020 election, you achieved operational success. But it very well might have been a gigantic fertile fallacy. A fertile fallacy that was propelled with reflexivity. And let's remember that reflexivity is the nonstop action of every cognitive avenue filling your senses and pathways to your mind with a constant river of information to ensure that the fertile fallacy is successful. Maybe you prefer to call this just propaganda. And so if you want the fertile fallacy to survive, you attach it to the nonstop hamster wheel of reflexivity in every media outlet, in every television network, in every social media outlet, in every legacy newspaper, in every single social media or news website, you proclaim the fertile fallacy to be truth and you shame anyone who dares to question the validity of your half truth you make sure that there is absolutely no debate over the fertile fallacy. Because if debate were to occur, if there was a finding of facts, if it was put through the process of falsification, your fertile fallacy, your lie that has legs that lead to operational success, well, your fertile fallacy could die a quick death. So you ensure that there are nonstop push notifications to phones about your fertile fallacy. You ensure that the airwaves are filled with stories of your fertile fallacy, which have a kernel of truth, but in its true core is a lie. You make sure that every single person on both sides of the aisle are fixated on this, your grand fertile fallacy, because this all needs to lead to your intended eventual operational success. And think about what other possible gigantic fertile fallacies came your way that completely disrupted and dismantled your life, your family, your work, and your nation. Well, 
If you recall in early January and February of 2020, being leaked all around the world was grainy video of dead people laying all over the streets in China who suddenly dropped dead from a virus. People in China screaming and wailing and panicking about this new health threat. Video of Chinese officers hauling away positive cases against their will because this is what had to happen to win this battle against the health threat. Supposed phone recordings from apparently distressed hospitals and morgues in China saying that there will be hundreds and thousands of bodies stacked up everywhere. And this was all being reported nonstop in every news outlet, all over Twitter, and they allowed it to be spread everywhere. And a lot of people got caught up in the hamster wheel of reflexivity in the United States. But in the United States, before the virus ever supposedly arrived here in the U.S., now I say supposedly because as I reported back in March and April of 2020, There was ample evidence that the virus was already in the United States back in 2019 and that it hadn't been named. No marketing campaign had been done for the virus yet. (laughs) So as soon as the marketing campaign was created in February of 2020, along with panicky fake videos from China, which were all propaganda, and the virus was given its marketable name, And so now you know the fake and staged videos that played on every mainstream news agency from China. The fake propaganda videos that showed the dead bodies of people that were just walking in the middle of the street in China and dropped dead. And the videos of the Chinese officials putting giant barricades in front of people's houses that had COVID to make sure that they didn't leave. And with everyone from China saying basically that if you caught COVID, that it was almost a certain death sentence if you were over the age of 50. Well, you know now that it was all propaganda to make you compliant. And you start to think back, well, what else was part of this that was all propaganda? And of course, while he was in Australia, Tom Hanks might have been the first person, a face that you knew, that caught COVID. And of course, everyone can relate to Tom Hanks. Because he's the most relatable actor of our age. And if he caught COVID, then you could too. Of course, remember that Tom Hanks was the first man you probably knew that uttered the words, The Great Reset. Back in his June 2020 commencement address at, well, anyway. Golly, who needs those details anyway, right? Because we're all in the midst of propaganda again. But, The panic was on back then. You knew that if you caught COVID, it would be like catching the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. There was no cure for this deadly disease. Scientists were absolutely baffled. And of course, the scientists that were maybe in the south of France and Marseille that said, actually, we found something that will help to make sure that people are able to easily survive this virus. They were silenced immediately. And any talk of that, of course, was banished. And so it was important that tests had started in the United States in the winter of 2020. And when they started the testing in the winter of 2020, the late winter, almost early spring, this led to the Eureka, the first positive case of the virus in the United States. And as a matter of fact, as they continued testing, it was everywhere in the world. So you receive push notifications to your phone every minute of every day telling you the next case of the virus in your state, in your town, in Minnesota and in Maryland, in California and in Kansas, in Zimbabwe and in London. So I'm sure you locked down completely. You scrubbed your groceries. Your church closed its doors. Your children's school closed down. And your only adventure was to head out to the grocery store where everyone else in your entire city was going at the exact same time to buy your groceries and maybe, just maybe, secure a few rolls of toilet paper. And your church closed down, of course, with all of your services now being forced to go digitally online. 
And there might have been some crazy pastors in California or Tampa that refused to stay locked down. And when those crazy pastors opened up, boy, was the strong arm of the law. Or, well, it really wasn't the law. It was more of the strong arm of the Department of Public Health, which, of course, takes precedence over the Constitution that came to shut down and arrest those pastors. And golly, it was the exact same scenario repeated in Canada. Almost like every nation had their old social contracts ripped up and replaced by a totally new social contract. And of course, because the news 24 hours a day was that if you did anything social with other people, you would either be killed or you would kill them. So you skipped your dearly beloved grandfather's funeral. And so did everybody else. And so you voluntarily shut down your business, fired your employees, and you lost just about everything in trying to just survive. But it was for the common good. But the good thing was, if you were in a red state, that at least they let you come into a restaurant to eat. Now, you had to wear a mask when you entered in the restaurant as you were walking, but apparently... The scientists found out that when you were seated at a restaurant, that you couldn't catch or transmit the virus when you were sitting down, so you could take off your mask and eat because it wasn't deadly then. But when you stood up, then you could transmit the virus once again. So apparently, the virus was affected by two feet worth of altitude. And all of your normal face-to-face business was all online, all of your communication. And all of the companies that were able to stay afloat during the reflexive pandemic made sure that all of their employees stayed home. They were not allowed to come into the office. Human-to-human contact was, of course, dangerous, deadly, in fact. But in the summer of 2020... All of the years of the operational preparation, the environment of pushing in critical race theory into our schools, our churches, our arts and entertainment, well, that was all brought to a boiling head. With you having to watch the death of George Floyd over and over and over and over on every news channel, everywhere on social media, repeated again and again and again, and you were told how you were to respond to George Floyd, and with every U.S. corporation joining in the chorus, with every major league sports team joining in, and with every person in the arts and entertainment industry joining in, with the Gospel Coalition and every major religious figure that had been pushing critical social justice over the past decade, condemning white supremacy, systemic white supremacy, and proclaiming that all cops are bastards and proclaiming allegiance to the Marxist organization that wants to abolish the nuclear family, destroy capitalism, and promote transsexuality. Black Lives Matter. And with entire portions of cities being brutally vandalized or burnt to the ground in Minneapolis, Santa Monica, Chicago, New York, with random cops and random people being beaten down by the mobs, and with a massive horde of young people shouting for a rebellion, the massive mob, ginned up by the media, constantly playing the George Floyd video, with congressmen and women calling for unrest in the streets, including our current Vice President Kamala Harris. A massive mob descended upon the White House, destroyed the grounds around the White House, and seriously injured dozens of Secret Service agents, with the President of the United States being rushed to a protective bunker. Yes, that happened. And then the mayor of Washington, D.C., thinking that she had the momentum of the propaganda, has the name of the revolutionary Marxist organization painted on the street just outside the White House. And now every corporation in the United States and the UK and Canada demanded that every employee go through training in diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
all brought about with the mass propaganda fertile fallacy that surrounded the death of George Floyd. And once again, let me remind you that a fertile fallacy is a lie that has legs. The fertile fallacy contains a kernel of truth, and yes, George Floyd died at the hands of the police, and it was horrible. But that wasn't the full story. And no one was interested in the full story. But this was about how the death of George Floyd could be used reflexively to start an outpour like color revolution in the United States, to start an American cultural revolution. And if you have been listening to Sovereign Nation since we started in 2017, I have been warning that this moment in time was being prepared. And if you recall, I released a podcast on the causes of things back in early 2019 called Out With The Old, In With The New, where I explained in detail that all of this was coming. My 2019 speech in London at our Speaking Truth to Social Justice Conference, I explained how this would be done in detail, that this was a crisis of truth. And I have tried to explain that all of these events, that the media have insisted that you must change your whole way of life and you must change your whole way of thinking. I explained in June of 2020 that this entire mess was going to be a part of what would be called a great reset. Back before anybody else was talking about these things. And very few paid attention back then. And I explained that very soon the narrative would shift from COVID and from Black Lives Matter to the climate crisis. And that everything had to be changed and changed right now. And I have been shouting from the rooftop since 2017 that you must understand that the primary forces behind all of this are the World Economic Forum, Open Societies Foundations, and China and that you must stop every time that you are told to think a certain way. That you must stop and question something when every media arm, when every Republican and Democrat together are telling you that you must care about what they care about, and you must agree to come to the same conclusions that they are coming to. No questions asked. And when the propaganda machines are turning, you must stop. And you got to take a moment to question and to discern and say, what are they trying to do once again? And why are they trying to make the entire world care about something that we didn't even care about three weeks ago? And maybe some of you will remember from about three weeks ago when I did the podcast, The Last Protest, when I warned that the entire COVID narrative was crumbling, and the truckers were winning, and the protests were gaining strength against governments all around the world. And of course, the globalists knew that this narrative had to be stopped, because people all over the world had woken up to the fact that they have been manipulated by the World Economic Forum and by China by those who are trying to destroy their lives and send them into digital slavery forever. And I explained that the globalists knew that their only way out would be war. And so here we are, at the beginning of another deadly, consequential Fertile Fallacy. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic. (laughs) 